Hello, I'm Malcolm Dome, and I'm delighted to say I'm here with Ken Hensley today. And we're going to be talking about the story behind his first solo album, Proud Words on the Dusty Shelf. Ken, uh, I was reading a couple of days ago an interview you did in 1973 with Melody Maker around the Proud Words on the Dusty Shelf album. And you made the point in that interview that you were so happy to have the album out because otherwise you were worried those songs would just be forgotten. Right. Looking back now, was there a moment when you thought, I've got all these songs, your eye heat will probably never do them, now I'm going to do a solo album? Yeah, absolutely, that was my thinking. I've always been the kind of person that's driven and determined to achieve something if I set my mind on it. And um, in those days, of course, in the days of vinyl, you were lucky to get eight or nine tracks on an yeah. album. So. By the time we'd done a couple of albums, I had a lot of songs left over, songs I liked and songs I wanted to record and get released. So I approached Jerry Bron and I, I asked him if it would be possible for me to do them as a solo record. And he gave me the okay. And we booked lands down. And uh, of course, a lot of the band members ended up being on, on the album yeah. too. So um yeah that was that was totally my motivation was to try to make sure they didn't end up as proud words on a dusty shelf which is obviously where the title comes from exactly um, exactly was that uh, getting jerry brom to produce the album was that your choice or his choice um it would have been his choice because at that time i wouldn't have cared mm, okay i just would have cared about being in the studio and, and making making the record so it would have been his choice but at the time, I would never have objected anyway because he was guiding us through that whole right. studio process with Heap anyway. It took a while to record, didn't it? Uh, for about maybe yeah. a year or something. It, it took a long time, but it was because I had to take sessions when I could get them right. when the band wasn't working, either live or rehearsing or whatever. So yeah, it did take a period of time, but I, I it didn't bother me at the time. You know? knew one day it would see the light of that. <laughs> Which is important of it. Did that make it easier in a way that you can actually take breaks and go back and revisit what you've already done? Like, oh, I'm not sure, I'm sure that works. Uh, no, we were never given that luxury. Um, it was basically we had to do the best job we could at the time and we were stuck with it. Um, <laughs> we never had time to go back and review. I mean, at the time, I was so busy. The band was busy. Mm. And with everything that was going on, um, there wasn't time to do that. You just had to get it right. You had a lot of songs, obviously, you wanted to try and cherry pick from. How did you decide which songs to use for that album? Uh, that was based on my own personal favourites out of the, all the ones I had. And I like some songs better than others. And I knew that some of the songs were not as strong. Hmm. So I tried to push the weak ones to one side and focus on the stronger tracks. Did you have demos done of all the tracks? No, I did not because I didn't have a facility to do demos. Right. They were all just uh, written as lyrics and the melodies were in my head and everything. So it was based on that. You, you did do some demos, didn't you? Because you'd worked with Paul Kozoff and Simon Kirk on, I think, four songs? Yeah, no, actually, uh, Paul only played on one song, but Simon helped me out with mm. a bunch of other songs. So me and my girlfriend were living with him and Paul in their apartment in Portobello Road. And I just kind of recruited them free of charge. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and I didn't have any money, but we went into Luxembourg Studios right. and we did, um, I particularly remember the demo of If I Had The Time because Kossoff plays some incredible guitar at the end of it. So. Did you think about getting him on the record itself? Well, it was so hard to get him to play on the demo that oh. I didn't even consider it. No, it was, it was actually Simon that convinced Paul Oh, to play. Right. Yeah. I mean, he played a few chords through the song when it came time to overdub him, but I wanted him to open up and solo at the end of the song when it was repeating yeah. and fading out. And he was very shy and, and didn't want to really do it. And it was Simon that talked him into it and, um, at one time. And then, it, then when he did cut loose, it was magic. Oh, it must have been incredible. It was. It was, and it still is. Oh, <laughs> it definitely you can't actually knock someone like that. No. And talking about incredible musicianship, listening back to Proud Words for the first time in a while yesterday, I have to say that what I love about your playing is that you never overdo it. This wasn't virtuoso performance. This is the song comes first and I'm playing within the song. 
That's 100% correct. Uh, it's always been the way I work and it's still the way I work. Mm. The song has to be the primary focus. Now, having said that, um, I've never set out to be a virtuoso musician. Uh, I, I, I never took the time to practice, mm. to learn how to play properly or anything. I just made it up as I went along. <laughs> and essentially the guitar and, and the piano, the keyboard, whatever keyboard it was, were tools I used to write songs with. Right. And so I never became, you know, a super guitar player or a super keyboard player. Um, I just simply put the song first and gave it whatever it was asking for. You see, I don't and, I st and I still do that. I, I think no, you are a super keyboard player. I think you should be acknowledged up there with John Lord, Keith Emerson and Rick Wakeman. Oh, when you're, you talking, should be. when you're talking about the Hammond, yeah, that was just something that um, I picked that up when I was very young. I, I saw Zoot Money and the big roll mm. band playing Stevenage. And uh, I remember thinking that that sound was so amazing. And then, of course, at that time, there was Georgie Fame and mm. Chris Farlow and all, all of these bands had a, had a Hammond player. And I played one in The Gods um, yeah. uh, because I wanted to reproduce the sound of Vanilla Fudge. And at that time, we also stole their vibrato, which found its way, the vocal <laughs> vibrato, which found its way into Uriah Heep. And I took some grief over that from... Um, from the guys in, in Cactus, you know, when, when they ah, when yeah. Fudge broke up and Cactus was formed and Carmine and Timmy <laughs> gave me a, a real bad time about nicking their vibrato. But yeah, the Hammond is just something, I love the sound of it mm. and I, I sort of taught myself how to play it and then I started to experiment and explore and created my own sound, which wasn't hard to do because I didn't know how to play properly. Whereas John and, and Rick Wakeman and, and Keith Emerson and players like that, that I was always ranked up there with, those guys were real musicians. I just kind of made it up and fudged along with it, but I saw it more, not just as a musical instrument, but as a tremendous sound effect. Mm, which is well. exactly what it is. Yeah. Was it your choice to go into the studio and play so many of the instruments yourself rather than getting in mates or people you knew to play guitar or do something like that? Well, yeah, it was because I was a bit of a bully in those days and I <laughs> I, uh, I saw it so clearly knew what I wanted mm. that it wasn't a problem for me to go ahead and just do it. Right. Um, the idea of bringing in specialists and guests and everything else only occurred occasionally. You had Gary Thane and Lee Kerslake on the album, obviously. Were they automatic choices for the rhythm section? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, Lee was the best drummer I ever worked with in that genre in that time. Mm. And Gary was unbelievable uh, and still to me the best rock and roll bass player that ever lived. And um, so the opportunity to have those guys yeah. was, was something I couldn't possibly turn down. What was it like for you though, having them not playing with you on your Uriah Heap album, but playing on your album with your vision and that's it? Um, it was pretty much the same. Philosophically, it was exactly the same. I just knew that both of them would bring the song exactly what it needed and both of them would do a fantastic job and they would contribute. They wouldn't just play. Right. They added something to, to the song. Did you do much pre-production for the album? Uh, not that I remember. You, you're going back a long time yes, now. Yes, I know, Malcolm. yeah. <laughs> More <laughs> so, than a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> not that I remember. Um, things like pre-production and so on like that didn't really exist at that time. We did a lot of pre-production for Heap in, in, in the studio, we went mm. in the rehearsal room. Mm. And that's where we did everything. But once we got into the studio, it was, you know, the red light went on and we had to get it right. So when we went to the studio to do the Proud Words album, as you said, the melodies were in your head. Did you just sit down and play through them so that Jerry Brown had an idea of what you were, where you were going with them? Sure, yeah, that's exactly what I did. And, and Jerry did participate in the choice of the song to some degree. Mm. But there was never much of an objection, so I assumed without objection that meant approval. Right. Which is probably a giant assumption on my part, but <laughs> that's the way I took it. And um, then it was just a question of sitting down with the players and playing them the song and having them pick it up. And that's the way it worked. The chemistry was fabulous in those days, and that's the way we did it then. You, you did a version of Rain on your album. Obviously, it's your song. He had done it beforehand. Why would you choose to actually, that's the song I want to show you the way it should be or the way it was meant to be in my head? I'm not sure that um, I did it because that, I thought that was the way it should be. 
I just or, wait. Was well, originally when you played it to them? I, I had I had an idea, uh, an alternative mm. idea in my head, and I wanted to do that, adding all the the, the big choral backing mm. vocals and so on. But um, so it just stands out as my own version of, yeah. of the song, and the original, of course, is untouchable because David's vocal on that is just unbelievable. Oh, and, brilliant. It's absolutely breathtaking. So I wouldn't attempt to go there. <laughs> <laughs> what about the other songs on the album? Were any of those songs that you had played to the band and they said not quite right for us? There were two or three songs that I had, had played to the band. I can't tell you which ones exactly, but, um, you know, the band was still finding its feet. Mm. We, we hadn't really finally settled our musical direction. So sometimes I'd bring a song into the, the studio that would confuse everyone. <laughs> it's, it's not really a good situation in the studio to be to have everybody confused. And Lady in Black's the most glaring example of that because when I played it to the band, they didn't want to record it. Mm. But Jerry did. And luckily he did. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, fortunately, yeah. When... Dave, David refused to sing it. Really? That's why I ended up singing <laughs> it. Yeah. Where did you get your lyrical ideas for this album? Uh, from the same place I still get them now, just from my imagination mainly. Right. Um, yeah, things I'd lived, experiences, um, things I heard, things I read, things people told me, um, events. Uh, those, those were the kinds of things which stimulated the thought mm. behind it. And that's still what happens. Uh, it all comes as a, an idea first, it becomes a lyric and then it becomes a song. I was thinking of King Without a Throne. Was that based on a person? Uh, I'd have to flash back a little bit there, Malcolm, because that's... Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It wasn't based on a person, no. I think it was based on a dream. Ah. Because... Um, or maybe it was based on me. <laughs> maybe I felt like I was a king, but nobody had given me a throne yet. And so... Rather than complain about it, I sang about it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get lyrical ideas from James? Are you the sort of person who sits down with a notepad by your, your, your bed or these days an iPhone or something, wake up, I've got an idea, and write it down? Yeah, well, no, I, don't, I don't have the notepad next to the bed. I think that would be a little bit anal, but um, <laughs> I, 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 if an idea comes, the first mm. thing I do is go to, go to the notepad right. and make sure that I capture it. I've only not done that once. And that was, I had a dream about Whitney Houston singing a song of mine. Mm. And I enjoyed the dream so much, I forgot to wake up and write it down. So <laughs> that one's out there somewhere. <laughs> maybe may, one day. Yeah, maybe it may, one, come, may come back one day. It may you, come back. You never yeah, know. There's, there's always hope. <laughs> well, with this album, did the lyrics come first, followed by the melody, or was it a combination of different ideas? I would say 99% of the time the lyrics come first, yes. And then you fit the melody around that. Well, what happens is the lyrics, uh, I don't want to sound pompous or maudlin, but mm. what happens is the lyrics tend to speak to me in, in, in melodic terms right. and rhythmic terms. So I can sit with a, a, a sheet of paper and a lyric in front of me and it will, it will give me the melody right. and, and the rhythm. Now this, this comes from uh, the days in early 70s when we'd be flying around the world um, uh, doing concerts and tours and of course jerry was setting recording dates like every nine months like we had to make an album every 10 months so i don't know why we had to do that but this kind of stresses the creative process yeah. a bit so the only way i could write songs in those days was to have a notepad with me and wherever i was on an airplane or in a toilet or a hotel room or a car scribble down the right. idea and then as soon as I got to an instrument, try to turn it into something of a tone poem rather than just a pure poem. So it was a habit mm. that I got into and, and it, it lasts to this day. But it is true that um, the words do really speak to me, honestly, in, in musical and rhythmic terms. When you were recording the album, did you find it easy to sing the parts on your head where you're hearing someone like David Byron thinking, what would he make of this? Oh, well, I was never the biggest fan of my own voice, but at the same time, I was such a jerk that I, 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 I said to myself, I don't know if I can do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Mm. And so I went ahead and did it. And I think it was better than I thought it was at the time because I've 
you know, a lot of people have complimented me on mm. some of the vocal performances on that. I wasn't trying to be anybody else. I was no. just, I was just singing the way I felt like singing, and I still do that. And all it comes across is the vocals are heartfelt. You actually connect the vocals to the lyrics without thinking, oh, it's just someone singing words. Well, no, I mean, your you know, words. Yeah, help, I, but, but it, in in some cases you're telling a story. In some cases you're just describing a life scenario or yeah. whatever. And obviously the goal is to try to make that as melodic as possible, but not lose the meaning. Yeah. And that's where David Byron was always, to me, the king. He brought mm. my songs to life. And so I would have used him as a point of reference yeah. and, and said, how can I do that? I can't sound like him. I can't express like him. I don't have the same range. But how can I achieve that where I can pull the meaning of the song and bring it to life right. in, in the best way possible? And so I did. I just sang the way I sang. Is there one song on the album you're especially proud of? Um, well, I'd have to have a look at the, uh, <laughs> look at the list here, if I may. Um, I think probably I'd have to say When Evening Comes is one of my favourites because I played a halfway decent guitar solo on there. So. No, you did. Yeah, it's, it's hard for me to pick favourites, Malcolm. It's no. always been hard for me to do that. I'm not talking about favourites. One song, yeah, we really nailed that one on this album. I oh, think. I, I feel that way about all of them. <laughs> fair, fair <laughs> enough. Did you have a deadline you had to meet? It's like the album has to be finished on this date. Always. Jerry was the king of deadlines. It was like, <laughs> you have to finish this by next week because we're going on tour or right, we're going yeah. by next week I, I want to release it the, f the week after and then then you have to have come up with another album <laughs> um you know i can give you numerous examples when boy i felt like a lot of pressure coming from the office about these ridiculous mm. recording schedules which axel rose never listened to <laughs> i got That's 10 months point. to produce a new album and, and he got 12 years <laughs> Or well, he took it anyway. Well, he took, yeah, yeah, right. He, he definitely took it. When you finished the album, did you play it to the rest of the band to see no. what their reaction was? No, no, no. I didn't. I felt like if I did that, I was rubbing their noses in it. Mm. You know, because I don't know exactly how the band truly felt about me doing a solo oh. album. They were never going to stop me because I would always, from the time I was a kid and I started first yeah. being in, in bands in Stevenage and, and so on, these are amateur or semi professional bands, but. From that time on, I was so focused and so determined that I was always going to do what I wanted to do, which made me a bit of a jerk. Uh, some might say a bit of an asshole, and maybe they're right. But confident. You know, it was simply the fact that I knew where I wanted to mm. go and what I wanted to do. That's nothing That's wrong with that. Absolutely. Well, I th it, it depends on what end of that attitude you are. You know, mm. you're on the side of it, not on the the front end. And I feel like I probably stepped on a few people and offended a few people in the process, but. Well, it obviously worked. <laughs> it did. You actually said that's probably the that sad <laughs> part about it. <laughs> well, or the positive part. You, you actually said in the Melody Maker interview that I referred to earlier that had you not done this solo album, you may well have considered leaving the band. Did I? Yes, you did. Was I? You didn't well, say you I... would leave the band, but you said you may well have considered leaving the band because she wanted those songs out there. Well, that might have been my attitude at the time. And, you know, I'm the kind of person that says, I don't, want, I don't know what I'm going to do now, but I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. That's when I finally left the band in June of 1980. That was exactly my position. I didn't had no idea where I was going to go, mm. but I knew I didn't want to do that anymore. Yeah. So it may well have been my attitude and, and, and thought position at the time. But uh, again, I'm reflecting back to a, no, a, of a long time ago. The, the album title, was that always in your mind, that's what we're going to call it? Yes, absolutely, because that's what those songs were. They were mm. rejected songs or set-aside songs simply because we couldn't fit more songs on, onto a vinyl record. Yeah, of course. Um, you got about 20 minutes, you know, aside. And so I just, uh, I thought it was a cool title. And um, then the title came, then the song came from the title. Right. Yeah. So it, it sort of made sense. It definitely, definitely does. It, it, you put it in your mind and that stands out as one of those titles. Yeah, I think I get what you mean. Yeah. Well, they were proud words as well. Mark. Oh, no, of course they are. And you should be proud of them. No, <laughs> no question about that. Well, I was going to be proud of it whether anybody <laughs> liked it or not. <laughs> did you have any input into what the cover design would be? Actually, I did. And, and I'm really pleased with the way that cover came out. I mean, Finn Costello at the time was kind of yeah. flavour of the month photographer. And um, 
we sat down and uh, you know we decided to do the portrait and and then they came up with the book idea mm. uh, and i just thought that that was a really cool idea and it was really well done yes very well done yeah but phoenix is a very good photographer and understands about yeah these things. no no, no it, it was a pleasure to work with him and i actually felt like it was an honor to have him doing it he, because he was like as i say the the industry's favourite mm. at the time. You're right there. Did you have in your mind any ideas of aspirations, what, what, how you wanted the album to be received, how it was going to sell, or were you more relieved it was out there? Um, I didn't really have any idea about how it was going to be received or what I wanted from the album. Mm. I just knew I wanted to get the album out. Uh, and again, somebody asked me not so long ago if I was competing with Uriah Heep mm. at the time and the answer to that would be definitely no I, I wasn't uh, trying to compete with anybody I was simply competing with myself and also in a way proving there was another string to your bow rather than just Uriah Heep you could do other things well I, I think so but I can only, I can promise you that as much of a jerk as maybe I was in those days I did not sit down and, and say I'm going to try I'm going to prove to anybody anything. Mm. It wasn't my goal. My goal was just simply to make a record of some songs which I really wanted to get released. Was there any consideration given to doing any live shows around the album? And obviously, hate schedule no, was crazy. absolutely not. I, in, in fact, I think Jerry and I might have had a conversation about let's keep that out of the equation right. because that would have been a real conflict. Yeah, that could, could have been slightly different. How do you look back on the album now? Oh, I'm... Um, super proud of it and you know I did more and I've done more since and every everything and many people tell me that of all the things I've done this is their favorite and I don't think they're my best songs I don't think they're my best performances necessarily but I think there's an innocence and an honesty about the record that um, marks it as a milestone in my career.